Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Box and Beyond, another great episode lined up for you today. And a topic that I've spoken about for a number of years, but I feel humbled that we get to speak to today's guest about the world of conversational AI, of automated speech recognition, and, and the future of business conversational interfaces. Mr. Patrick Ellen over at our partner Unifor. So Patrick, great to have you on the show today. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Thanks for having me on. And I know we've caught up a few times now for everybody else who isn't already aware of your background and why you are such an expert in this particular. It's very traditional for our Boston Beyond guests to have to introduce themselves with their who you are, what you do, and more importantly, why you do it. So over to you. Yeah, sure. I mean, th- th- that could be a long story. I, in, in terms of what I'm doing right now, I'm the, the VP of, of AI at Unifor, and uh, I've been in the AI business for about 25 years now, since uh, the late 1990s. But I, I kind of got started on all this as a kid in the early 1980s after I read the the novelization of the movie, the Stanley Kubrick movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, and, and kind of just got fascinated with this idea that, you know, you could have a computer that that talked to you. And at the time, not many people had computers, but we had a, a rather large one, actually, because my dad was a computer hobbyist and an econometrician. And so we had this computer that was about the size of a refrigerator with blinking lights and uh, reel-to-reel tapes kind of moving back and forth and stuff. And, and so at the time, I thought, wow, I have like this thing that nobody else has, this cool computer, and there must be a way for me to figure out how to make it talk to me. And so I kind of started doing that at a very early age, just messing around with programming and and all of that. And, you know, later in life, when I kind of got to college... AI wasn't really a thing that you were going to make a career out of. It was still sort of science fiction. And so I studied psychology, but ended up when I was in graduate school, getting a degree in, in cognitive psychology. I focused on the psychology of language and at the time got a job first at Dragon, which was one of the first speech recognition companies. So I interned there, just sort of being very fascinated with you know the technology and how it worked and all that. And then shortly after that, the following summer, got an internship at AT&T Labs, where there were lots of people still left over from the old Bell Labs, and you know, it was just sort of a great research institution. And this really sort of launched my career in you know, studying and implementing technologies that use speech recognition and natural language understanding and what we call multimodal, which is where you're sort of you know mixing different modes of input and output. And uh, yeah, that that kind of set me off. And then after. After I finished at uh, my PhD, I ended up getting a postdoc at Stanford University at a place called CSLI, which stands for the Cent- Center for the Study of Language and Information. And I was there for a few years. CSLI was really this sort of AI mecca. You know, they would get all these inter- interdisciplinary professors together from places, you know, researchers from psychology and mathematics and computer science. And in fact, uh, one of the, the guys who was there at the time was a guy named John McCarthy, who actually coined the term artificial intelligence back in the early 1950s. And so so that was very interesting. In fact, it was kind of funny. When I first started there, you know, you, you go to lectures, people are giving interesting talks and, uh, you know, very important people in the in the field and there was this old guy who would always come shuffling in kind of late and he'd be sort of loud at the door and he'd go all the way to the front of the room and you know it was a little bit disruptive and at first I was like who is this old guy and then somebody told me oh that's John McCarthy (laughs) I was like oh okay so he can do whatever he wants and make as much noise as he likes (laughs) but uh, that that was a very interesting time Absolutely amazing. So you just completely confirmed to the rest of the audience why we really need to listen to what you have to say on this topic. So that is exactly the type of background information that is uh, is, is very unique to you, longstanding, and uh, why I'm so excited to quiz you on some of these things. Now, there's a couple of things you, you spoke about, about there. I want to get and dig into one of them. So early life, computers, like before most people even had computers, you were thinking, how on earth can I turn this into a conversational interface? So clearly you were 30, 40, 50 years in front of most other people just even having that particular thought. 
Now, you you got to live out some some boyhood experiences. You mentioned the Space Odyssey and 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 other films and and Al, right? So you were right. literally trying to live this out. Talk to us about like the DARPA initiative that you were that you were part of. What was that? You know, because it it blew my mind when when you spoke about about it in our catch up. Yeah, you know, so for you know your your listener who might not have seen the movie or read the book for 2001 a space odyssey i mean it involves this ai named hal that goes a bit haywire and it's actually sort of an interesting psychological story about you know how do if you invented an ai and uh, then it sort of gets psychologically conflicted you know how might that sort of play out but so yeah it was always sort of one of my dreams to to be able to you know build something like that or something you know like the computer that's on the the bridge of the star ship enterprise you know that you just say you know computer you know where is lieutenant uhura or something so when i when i got to stanford at csli they were just starting working on this big darpa initiative called the darpa kalo project it was a big you know multi-institution initiative that was kind of led by people at sri which was just down the road from us and the idea behind darpa kalo was a five-year multi-institution you know sort of big money DARPA project to basically kind of try to build the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, you know, for use on, I don't know, ships, submarines, you know, whatever you want to think about. Most of these, you know, DARPA things, it's DARPA is obviously a defense department, you know, sort of funded thing. So you're kind of thinking about how these things are going to work into the Department of Defense. But the, the the main thing that was interesting was just you know can you build this computer system that you know you could talk to it would talk back it would have awareness of sort of contextuality of the things that are going on around it and one of the things that we were most focused on at Stanford was you know people have meetings all the time where everybody's sort of sitting around a table and talking to each other could you build a computer system that is able to listen to multiple humans talking to each other about you know any kind of subject and understand what's going on you know to the extent that you could then have a record of the meetings maybe pull out things like the the action items that people agreed to or the topics that they were talking about you know and kind of automate a lot of the things that you know right now we still kind of do with just pencil and paper or, you know, writing your action items in a notebook or or what have you. So we worked on that for a few years. And that was a very exciting, exciting project. W- one interesting offshoot of that was uh, after the DARPA Kalo project ended, some folks at SRI decided that they were going to try to take some of that technology and and create a, a spin it off into a, a startup. So they did that and they called the startup Siri. And then about a year later, this got bought by Apple for quite a tidy sum of money. And now everybody who has an iPhone has it incorporated into their iPhones. So, so that, that, that was an interesting time to, you know, be in on the ground floor of something that, uh, you know, most of us are aware of in the world today. And it kind of, you know, started there. What a great story and a great initiative to be involved in. And as I say, right at the very start of, you know, what we now Conversational AI is 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 something that's on the lips of many business leaders. You know, certainly in the customer service, customer experience in the world of automation. You know, this is an exciting area to be in. For you, it might even be classed as a bit boring now. Hey, I've been there. I got the T-shirt. My journey started 50 years ago, guys. Thank you for catching up. So, what? got you or what's kept you excited about this and why was Unifor the place where you were continuing this journey yeah and it, it, it's never boring Wayne I mean it's it's still as exciting as it was on you know the first day that I was working with this stuff and you know one of the things that that keeps it so exciting is just the fact that it is such a difficult problem and even though you know we've we've had a lot of leaps and bounds in terms of our abilities to do things you know the fact that you can talk into your phone and dictate a text message and you know ask the phone to send it to your wife or whatever you know that's that's definitely a technology that wasn't around 10 years ago and so it's super exciting for us to to be able to do that likewise for us to have you know alexas in our home that we can ask to turn off the lights or ask it what the weather's going to be and and all that sort of thing but you know, if you really think about it, 
the conversations that you have with Alexa are not anywhere near the quality of the conversations that you can have with another human being, like the kinds of conversation that you know you and I are having right now. You know, as sophisticated as it is, an Alexa or as my Alexa is actually looking at me right now. It thinks that I'm talking to it, which which kind of speaks to you know what I'm trying to say here, which is that you know. Humans understand something like, is that person speaking to me or are they speaking about me? You know, they can listen to a context and they sort of understand the context in which their name is being uttered and, you know, whether this requires you to, you know, respond to somebody or not. In the case of the systems we have right now, this knowledge about context that, you know, humans bring to every conversation is severely limited. And we're trying to improve that as much as we can. But the bottom line is, we still don't really understand how humans sort of take in the context, take in the environment that's around them, represent it mentally, and then use that to sort of shape their ideas of what is appropriate to say in a conversation, what is the appropriate way to interpret something, you know. And we all know that that is something that varies from human to human. You know, some people misinterpret what other people say because of their idea of what the context, you know, what they think the context is. You know, you take the case of sarcasm. One person might recognize that it's sarcasm. Another person might think that somebody's being serious. So obviously there's some type of representation there that happens in the human mind that determines how you understand language and how you formulate the things that you want to say. But these are things that, we still have no kind of formalized idea of how that works, and therefore it's not really something that we know how to implement in a machine. So, so this is what gets me up every morning is just being excited about thinking about, you know, how can we sort of add these extra, you know, capabilities into conversational systems that will bring them beyond their fairly limited capabilities as we know them right now. Amazing. So I'm used to hearing about conversational AI as a mechanism to converse between a human and a, and a machine more often than not. But there's a lot more to it than that. Talk to us a little bit more about, and I think you you, you Gross a little bit on that subject there, but you know, what does conversational AI mean to you? And what are all those different facets that we that, that it entails? I'd be really keen to to pick your brain on what conversational AI means to you as a true expert in this field. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And you know, one of the things that excited me about sort of coming to Unifor when I was deciding to do that was just the fact that so much of what they were doing was focused on human to human conversation, you know, which is a, a very different endeavor from a lot of the sort of conversational AI, you know, companies that you think of today, where you're mostly looking at, you know, chat bots or voice bots or that sort of thing where you have a person talking to a machine, you know, so in the case of Alexa, for example, you know, a human says something, the machine says something back, you know, maybe you can get a little bit of a dialogue going there. But for the most part, it's very limited. And people speak, tend to speak very differently when they're speaking to a machine or when they know they're speaking to a machine. They use much simpler sentence structures and syntax. They tend to limit their vocabulary in certain ways. They don't assume that they can, you know, interrupt or restart their sentences or that sort of thing. So when humans talk to each other, you know, we're, we, we sort of throw off all these shackles and uh, we, you know, unless you're talking to somebody who is in a foreign country or something, you tend to assume that that person is, you know, fairly competent at understanding conversational, you know, language. And, you know, you you just sort of speak freely and interrupt each other, you know, that sort of thing. So when it comes to trying to get a system that will understand, you know, humans talking to other humans, maybe two humans talking to each other, that's difficult in itself. When you get multiple people, you know, say like four or five people in a meeting, as I was talking about with the DARPA Kalo project, you know, things suddenly get very complicated and humans are able to sit there and follow the conversation of five or six people in a room all talking to each other pretty well. This is actually a much more difficult problem for a machine to do compared to just the human to machine case. So 
when I came to Unifor, that was something that you know was was really exciting to me was that they were really focused on this customer service case where you have a human customer who calls in and they're talking to a human agent. And so you're trying to listen to two people who are having a conversation and their their task in that conversation is to understand each other. It's not to have a machine understand them. That that is quite the the difficult task. A voice is just inherently more complex than than text, right? Because you have accents. You know, we, we can say the same thing. And I, I have I laugh with my American colleagues and clients all of the time that my pronunciation of something could be very different to the pronunciation. It is spelled more often than not the same way. Uh-huh. pronunciation, accent, you know, such a difficult challenge. And then you have two people conversing in highly likely to be different accents and context and all of those things. I mean, it is an incredible challenge. So no wonder it's still exciting you. But that's today. I always like to think about tomorrow as well. Yeah. Conversational AI 2.0. Like, where is this all going? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, you know, I, I think I've given you a little bit of sort of a peek into where where I think we could be going. But if, if we sort of think about, you know, conver- what is conversational AI 1.0? Well, you know, maybe that's all the stuff that we're 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 kind of used to by now. You know, the the idea of being able to, you know, give commands to an Alexa or to a Siri and have it respond to you and, you know, do some kind of action, simple sort of interaction with a, you know, with a, a voice bot. Or we might also think of it as, you know, we've got two humans talking to each other and maybe you're not really doing a sophisticated understanding of what they're saying, but you're able to do enough sort of word spotting and you know pulling enough out of what is going on between two people that you can hopefully do a pretty good job of you know kind of tracking what people are talking about and you know doing doing the things that you might expect a, a conversational AI to to do. So. Given sort of you know the limitations that we've already talked about, you know how do we get to a a more sophisticated system that you know isn't just doing word spotting and is really sort of listening to and understanding you know most of what you're saying you know in in the course of a conversation and could maybe have a more sophisticated conversation with you that kind of understands the the context and I think that you know that the answer behind this is in learning how to incorporate context into the understanding of the conversation because this is what you know humans do we we come to a conversation we already have sort of a, a a mutual store of information that we share you know we're part of a, a language speaking community we're part of a culture that knows you know who the president of the united states is and what it feels like when the wind is cold and you know all these types of things so that is a you know shared context that we all have that uh, people have been trying for some time to figure out ways to represent that context so that if you you know said something similar to a machine you know saying that you know for example saying you know gee it's it's windy outside the machine might understand that, uh, that you know there are certain things that go along with that 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 you know sets up a certain situation that you know maybe it's cold or maybe things are going to blow away and you know all the things that humans just sort of know by virtue of the fact that we're human beings that a machine doesn't necessarily know so so that's part of it is bringing sort of knowledge about the world into these conversational systems another part of it is bringing knowledge knowledge about the world in a different way which is, I I referred earlier to sort of, you know, multimodal cases, which is where, you know, if you think of your Alexa or your Siri, it's just listening to what you're saying. It's listening to the the audio and responding to that. But humans bring in lots of other information. You know, usually if you're in a situation where you're talking to somebody in person or even over Zoom or something, you're able to see each other and see gestures that people are making, see their facial expressions. You're able to gauge what their emotions are. You're able to see if, you know, even if you're talking on Zoom, if somebody's kid comes into the room and they turn and they start talking to the kid, 
you understand that they're not talking to you now, that the, you know, what they're saying is relevant to a different conversation from the one that you're having. So this is something that, you know, we're still pretty far away from being able to develop conversational AI that is just, you know, easily does this kind of thing. We're, we're getting there. And, you know, one of the, the products that, that Unifor recently re released is our, our Q for Sales product, which was sort of geared towards allowing salespeople who nowadays are doing a lot of these sales meetings on Zoom calls, and you've got like five people on a Zoom call, but can you have an AI that is sort of watching all the people on the call and kind of gauging, you know, what their level of engagement is, what their emotional status might be, and trying to turn all of that into you know, some picture of like, in the case of a sales call, like, you know, hey, are things going well? Or are they not going so well? Are you boring everybody to death? Should you move to the next slide? You know, that sort of thing. So this is a way of just bringing lots more context into, you know, that conversational analysis realm. And so I, th I think that's something that we're going to start seeing a lot more of. Superb, I, I guess, you know, going back full circle here, you know, a true Surrey for business in that in, in that instance then but i i love the idea of the the multi multimodal it's something i've heard talked about a lot more in the last kind of six to 12 months than they had done before and it's interesting how in the work context i think that does add potentially even more benefit than in the in the personal and in, in your personal life because of the intricacies of engagement and paying attention and body language you know especially as you mentioned in the kind of sales world and also in in, in the service land as well I'm, I'm sure so that's that's interesting really really interesting yep. that that would that that would come out you know how you, you mentioned that we're not there yet i mean how how far away do you think we're going to be to let's let's say you know a true conversational interface for business systems you know a Siri for business where you and I, and I, I coined well I didn't coin it I, I, I used this term before universal search you know and hey hey Siri can you get me last month's report from Dave please or hey Siri there was an action that came out of that meeting last week I think it was given to Steve you know what was the action again that whole, you know, that for me is, is is where business needs to kind of maneuver towards. Yep. And, you know, it's a big business problem, right? It's not like you're conversing with a customer, but again, it's, it's conversational AI. It's a value, a benefit that conversational AI could bring to the enterprise. And it's not just automating a customer query which is kind of where we are right now. Hey, I can do it cheaper, faster, better, and 24 seven, great. And that's great for organizations you know, who have customer engagement or who have you know, engagement between employees across different departments, but it doesn't change the way that you work. True conversational AI in the sense of, hey, you know, a conversational interface that replicates search through your voice is, is pretty groundbreaking. I would I would hazard a guess. How how far away do you think that type of interaction is going to be? I think we're at a point where you know at least the basic technology for being able to implement a system like that is there. And and right now, you know that technology is mostly sort of getting used in the enterprise case. And you know, for example, you know we're building systems that. When customer service agents are talking to customers and the customers mention, you know, let's say last month's bill or something, the system is able to listen to that and say, aha, I should go and get last month's bill. You know, so it's not very different of a problem from from what you're describing. You know, if you could have a Siri type system that, uh, you know, can monitor all your meetings and and sort of keep track of, you know, what has been said, our, our queue for sales th that I mentioned a minute ago also has a sort of action item detection mechanism in it that will, you know, detect and record when people, you know, make commitments of, of some sort. So all of that is not very far off. I think, I think in terms of, you know, coming up with a consumer product that gets, you know, integrated into something like Microsoft Teams or Zoom or or something like that, you know, it's, it's, it's just a matter for a business to put together the 
the the business plan to implement something like that. And I don't know if that will come from a, a Microsoft or an IBM, or if it will come from a company like Unifor. Definitely the technologies that we're working on now could trickle down into, you know, a more consumer focused you know, implementation like that. Excellent. Okay. So not too far away. So watch this space, I watch guess, is, is the message coming out of this. So fantastic. Well, I think that's pretty much all we've got time for today. This has been absolutely phenomenal i i tell all my guests that i i usually re-watch these or re-listen to these episodes during one of my many daily runs so i'm really looking forward to listening to this but and just reabsorbing all of that insight and history into in the world of conversational ai so patrick thank you ever so much for being such a brilliant guest and for being so open about the the, the past and the future yeah, it's really been my pleasure. Uh, this has been a great conversation and you know, I look forward to talking to you again and hopefully we'll have some new interesting developments that uh, you know are happening sooner rather than later. Well, thank you, Patrick. Thank you all for listening. And uh, as, as always, we'll see you again in another couple of weeks for another episode of Bots and Beyond. Mm-hmm.